from what high school did you graduate and in what year did you graduate? Oh, for goodness sakes, Mr. Smith is a 45-year-old man who works as a security guard in a downtown building who happened to witness an accident at 16th and Market Streets. So of what possible relevance is where he went to high school? Could you please answer the question? Central High, 1985. Did you attend college? You're kidding me. That's even less relevant. Ask another question. Mr. Smith, uh, please answer my question. I went to community college for about 18 months. Did you leave voluntarily? Who cares? I don't care. The judge won't care. The jury won't care. In fact, if you try to ask that kind of question at trial, the judge will shut you down real fast. Mr. Smith, please answer the question. It just wasn't for me, so I left and went to work. What was your first job then after you left the community college? You want to know what he did 20 years ago to make a buck? <laughs> really? This is beyond the pale. When this deposition is over, I'm going to show the transcript to the partner to whom you report. He and I go back a long time. And I guarantee you, he is going to be embarrassed when he reads it. And I guarantee you're going to be embarrassed when he calls you into his office to discuss it. Counselor, the questions I'm asking are perfectly appropriate. I have a right to learn anything that I want to know about the witness's background. I can move through these questions, these preliminary questions, much quicker if uh, we can eliminate the interruptions, please. Are you lecturing me about depositions? How long have you been practicing? Do you know how long I've been trying cases in this city? Big cases, by the way. Get to the point of we're leaving. I have to leave soon anyway for a lunch date with Judge Roberts. I figure you've got 20 minutes to complete your questioning. Would the court reporter please read the question back? And um, Mr. Smith, would you be kind enough to just answer the question that I asked Mr. Smith? Can you confirm that as of January 15, 2012, Mr. Jones was a partner of ABC Tech while he was still employed by Universal Tech and teaching at Universal Tech? Objection. No foundation assumes facts not in evidence. It's argumentative, invades the attorney-client privilege and the work product doctrine. Instruct the witness not to answer. Mr. Smith? Are you going to follow your counselor's advice and not answer that question? What kind of question is that? Of course he will follow my advice. And you're invading the attorney-client privilege and the work product doctrine. Instruct the witness not to answer. Mr. Smith, while you were working at ABC Tech, did you copy your ABC Tech course materials to use when you started working at Universal Tech. Objection. Still no foundation. Assumes facts not in evidence. Instruct the witness not to answer. Mr. Smith, did Mr. Jones help Universal Tech in any way to develop course material while he was still working with you at ABC Tech? Same objection. No foundation. Assumes he knows what Jones did instruct the witness not to answer. Mr. Smith, did you speak with Mr. Jones about preparing course materials? If you recall. I don't recall. Had Mr. Jones ever told you anything about the course materials? That's a stupid question. He told you he doesn't recall if he ever spoke to Jones about the materials. It's absolutely speculative, no foundation or anything else. So if you're going to ask unfair questions, I'm going to correct them. Are you finished? Yes. Under, yes. Our, under our rules, Counselor, you may not make speaking objections. You may only state that you have an objection. Would you please, from this point forward, confine yourself to stating that you have an objection and not engage in what we all know are speaking objections. Don't, don't ever presume to tell me what to do. I am being straight with the guy and you are not being straight with the guy. You are trying to get him to say things that are untrue 
it's an old trick. I think you're coaching this witness. I am telling him what the question is so he can answer it. You are making speaking objections and you know as well as I know that that is inappropriate. Don't lecture me. You're an idiot. I've been doing this since you were chasing cheerleaders, puppy. Ms. Albert, would you please mark where we are in the, de in the transcript? Um, we will be calling the court later this afternoon and I will want you to be able to locate and review and read for the court what's transpired these last few minutes during this deposition. Yes. Thank you. Have you had any conversations with Mr. Jones about working for Universal Tech? M Mr. Smith, the court reporter and we need you to give a verbal response. I noticed you nodded your head yes, but please give us a verbal response. Mm -hmm. Could you please give a verbal response? I did. Yes. What? Your answer is yes. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? It is. Did Mr. Jones, when you had that conversation, tell you anything about course materials that Universal Tech needed? If you recall. I don't recall. Mr. Smith, I'm handing you what's been marked as Exhibit A in your deposition. I believe it is a copy of the ABC Tech course material. Can you tell me when you first worked with this material? If you recall. I don't recall. Do you recognize Exhibit A as course material at ABC Tech? If you know. I don't know. Are you finished making comments, Counselor? I, I'll make whatever comments I choose to make. Just ask your questions. Do you recognize, Mr. Smith, Exhibit A, which I've put before you, as course material at ABC Tech? And take your time and review it carefully. It looks familiar, but I don't know whether it was used at ABC Tech. Can you tell me when you first saw Exhibit 8, when you first saw this document? If you recall. I don't recall. Mr. Smith, I'm sure that you are the person here who best knows what you know and what you do not know. Is that correct? Yes. I only want you to tell me what you know. You don't need to be reminded repeatedly by your counsel of what you know or don't know. Is that correct? That is correct. Mr. Smith, I asked you what Mr. Jones told you about course materials, and we're going to stay here until you do, if it takes all day. Well, I don't really recall exactly what we talked about, but I'm certain that we didn't talk about course materials. Uh, let me say that the conduct of the defending lawyer here was so antithetical to what the American College of Trial Lawyers stands for uh, that we could not get any fellow from the college to play the role uh, for fear that uh, the tape would end up on the internet and people would not realize that it was uh, solely for solely for teaching purposes. Um, uh, Lynn, uh, let me start with you. Um, it, it looked to me as if the defenders making all sorts of offensive comments and so forth, and that for the most part you simply ignored what he was doing. And from where I was in the room, it looked like you uh, maintained eye contact with the witness and did not look at the defender. Uh, I, I guess, first of all, did I get it right? And secondly, if so, what were you doing? Well. You, you did get it right, Dennis. Um, when I was a young attorney, my um, senior partner gave me some good advice, uh, and that is to ignore the other attorneys in the room, some of whom will be jerks, and focus on what you're there to accomplish. 
and I grew up taking a lot of depositions, especially in medical malpractice cases, where some attorneys felt it was their obligation to literally object to almost every question. And the only way to get through that is just to continue to look at the witness, pay no attention to the attorney, and continue to ask your questions. Once in a while, you may want to interject something like counsel have you finished or something like that but I think the best way is just to proceed because you're not going to win an argument you're not going to convince the lawyer to stop doing whatever he or she has been doing for years and that is purposefully obstructing the flow of the deposition or purposefully trying to coach the witness um, you know, you're not going to change someone, so you might as well go about your business in a very polite and appropriate manner. And if you eventually have to bring it to a judge, either during the day of the deposition or some later day, the juxtaposition between your conduct and the other attorneys is manifest. So yes, I think just keep looking at the witness, and the witness will get the picture too that you're being nice and you're just trying to get information. What do you think, Cody? I agree with Lynn. I think persistence is the key and the eye contact with the witness. And uh, if, if you do that, and I think the bottom line question on whether you ultimately go to the court is did, get, did you get answers, fair answers to the questions you ask and, and the information that you need for your case? Yeah, if I could pick up on uh, those same uh, comments, uh, I think sometimes when you're in the deposition and you're facing this kind of a defender, there's a certain rhythm or cadence that develops that is question, speaking objection, <laughs> answer the question, and then the witness answers. Um, question, speaking objection, answer the question, and the witness answers. And I think that has a, an effect uh, at least one way and sometimes two. Um, you can see sometimes that the witness is puzzled or distressed, that his lawyer seems to be making these terrific speeches and speaking objections, but it always ends with the guy on the other side of the table telling him to answer the question and he, and he has to answer it. Sometimes, if you get lucky, uh, the defending lawyer will gradually fade. And I, I think it's uh, the idea of maintaining eye, eye contact uh, is very helpful in that regard. It's a little bit as if two people are having a conversation and you walk up to join it and you say a couple of things and people act as if you're not even there. Well, what do you do? Pretty soon you, <clears throat> you walk away and talk to somebody who's interested in, in talking to you. Um, so I, 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 think that can, uh, I think that can really, really work for you. Um, Hootie, there were, I say Hootie, we've been calling him George here, but... Uh, I'll answer to Hootie. <laughs> he, he, he'll answer to either. Uh, there were comments like, if you know, uh, if you remember, and then different speaking objections, that is an objection that was more than just form, objection. and then a brief statement as to what the form problem was. Um, uh, are those proper objections? How do you deal with that? In local practice, where, where I practice, uh, in, in, uh, is that nobody gets too upset about if you interject, do you know? But it's the speaking objections that where, where the uh, the opposing counsel starts going into his own version of the facts. And uh, for, for example, if he says, well, th I actually, the lawyer says, I actually prepared this, this chart or this spreadsheet, uh, and you don't tell him then, but when the deposition's over, you tell him your deposition's next. But it, it's, the, the co it's the objection that coaches the witness. And, and influences the answer. I think it's improper. I don't. I don't get upset at all about. Do you know? In fact, I do that occasionally. What do you think, Lynn? Well, one of the things that um, I, I think we all need to know when we start taking depositions is we need to know the rules. We need to know the local rules. We may need to know what the judge that we're in front of may think about these issues. And I always refer our attorneys, and I refer all the time to the American Bar Association 
civil discovery standards, first published in 1999 and then amended in August of 2004. And the section on depositions, I think, is very helpful. And it's, you know, it's not a rule or it's not the law, but it certainly is a good reminder. And even though I said earlier that you don't necessarily change what an attorney may do, and it takes two to argue, and you don't really want to argue, but you may want to, especially if you're a younger attorney, point out these ABA guidelines or standards that really prohibit anything other than a very short objection to form or objection non-responsive, you know, wh whatever the short objection is. And speaking objections in case after case after case are, 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 are found to be totally inappropriate. And one thing which is interesting in these guidelines is they suggest that if you have speaking objections or the, you know, if you know or if you remember and the witness always says, no, I don't remember, I don't know, you can actually have the judge allow you to read certain portions of a deposition or show it during trial to attack or on the issue of the witness's credibility. And it's pretty devastating to play a portion of a deposition where the lawyer for this witness is being a jerk and the witness is kind of following whatever the lawyer says and you can attack the credibility by showing that or reading it. Uh, and that's something that until I reviewed these guidelines a number of years ago, I wasn't aware you could really do. Uh, so it's, it, it's pretty threatening and I, and I think just going back to another point that you made, if you're getting the information you need, just keep moving, keep moving <coughs> and ignore the jerk because as I mentioned, it takes two to make an argument. And once you start arguing, if you ever That's present this to a Joe, who started the argument? And you lose your focus. <clears throat> lose your focus. That's right. I've uh, sometimes said when a, an opponent uh, says, if you know, and then the witness says, I don't know. I've sometimes followed up by saying to the witness, did you take that comment from your lawyer to mean you were supposed to know, I, to say, I don't know. Now. Uh, very often it leads to kind of a my, uh, minor brush fire while the uh, uh, attorney expresses uh, feigned outrage that any such thing was going on. Uh, but on a couple of occasions I've heard the witness, I've had the witness say yes, <laughs> that he did take it uh, as a prompt. Um, the other side of it is every once in a while when you're uh, defending a witness, you have the feeling that the witness is starting to answer questions where he does not know the answer, but he has slipped into the mode of taking an examination in high school or college where if you don't know the answer, you guess because you might get extra points. And something I've found is rather than saying if you know, if you start by saying to the witness, answer Mr. Johnson's question. He's entitled to an answer. However, if you don't have the information necessary to answer his question, tell him that. And I've never once heard or had an opponent react negatively to that, partly because you hope that by that point you've established some credibility with your opponent that you're not going to try to obstruct the process. And I think also a part of it is that you're saying to uh, the witness, you begin with um, answer the question. Uh, who, uh, George, are there, um, are there intermediate solutions that you can get? You're in the middle of this very unpleasant uh, deposition with an obstructive opponent. Uh, are there things you can do so that you don't have to wait and file a motion and all that kind of thing? Well, in federal court in particular, uh, our magistrates in Lafayette, and Baton Rouge, uh, New Orleans, Shreveport, uh, you can call a magistrate directly and they will, if they're available, they will take the uh, uh, call and, uh, and, 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 give an, and, and issue a verbal order that they later, later put into a minute entry to tell them to answer the question or they don't have to answer the question. Uh, common, I think a common one I see is when counsel instructs a witness uh, 
uh, not to answer. And it's and, and generally speaking, in our jurisdiction, it's got to be privileged. Yes. And uh, if if it's on a key point, I think at that point you call the magistrate. Yeah, I I agree. And one of the other things, um, if you are going to call the magistrate or the judge, or if you are going to wait until the deposition is completed, or you suspend the deposition in anticipation of filing a motion for sanctions, whether it be for instructing a witness not to answer or whether it be for other obstructive types of conduct, follow through with it. You know, don't be the lawyer who cried wolf. You know, it's like with children. If you are going to punish them, punish them. If, if, don't threaten to do it. So as, a, as an attorney, you're going to be taken much more seriously is if you during a deposition, tell the opponent, the opposing lawyer, I'm going to file a motion for sanctions and list the reasons why. Give the lawyer an opportunity to correct whatever he or she has done wrong and allow their witness to correct it right then. If they don't do it, then file the motion for sanctions and follow through with it. I mean, you, you, that, that's what sanctions are for. And so if you do that and you consistently do that and you are right, and if you're polite, and if you handle things the right way, eventually it's going to stop. And eventually you will have built up a lot of credibility with the court um, in, in many different ways. It's very similar, analogous, I suppose, to the reputation of a lawyer who will, the, his opponent knows, this guy will take it to trial on the merits. And it, it, I Same think it's, it's very similar. Dennis, one, one thing that uh, I wanted to see if you could comment on was how do you, as a as a defender, how do you handle the abusive lawyer who's taking the deposition? Well, <clears throat> I think um, you know more often than not, uh, it is the defender who sets the tone for the right. deposition yeah. because usually when you're talking about <clears throat> obje uh, uh, conduct, it's the kind of thing that we saw portrayed here with. Uh, uh, baseless objections, speaking objections, instructions not to answer, uh, personally abusive comments, and that kind of thing. If, if, the, if it is the uh, interrogator who is uh, being uh, overly aggressive or more than that, um, I will make my objection, and then it depends on in what way it is being, uh, he is being abusive. If he's being abusive by cranking in some uh, some description of the witness that's uh, personal and, and out of line, um, I'll simply say to the witness, uh, don't answer the question. Uh, Mr. So-and-so, if you want to rephrase the question and delete uh, that offensive part, then, then we'll move along. And again, I think I think the key is to just uh, to just keep your cool and convey a sense that that the witness is here uh, to answer questions. We don't have any concern about that, and we're not going to not going to be thrown off our thrown off our game uh, just simply because you raise your voice and that kind of thing. I think uh, one thing that helps on that is if it's. If it's particularly if it's your client or your your client's employee, it's, it's your witness you're defending, and you know that the guy on the other side is is a, is a jerk. You can prepare him for that. I think that goes a pre preparation. Just he he's loudmouth, he's obnoxious. Listen to his question and answer his question. Don't be intimidated. Don't fight with him. That's what I'm here to do. I think I think it's you know the same both ways also. If if you have that situation and if there should be sanctions follow through with sanctions. But I agree that if you prepare your witness correctly and have your witness have the same demeanor you do, and that is listen politely and answer the question, then it's going to be fine. I, I always tell my witnesses that I'm preparing about three things. Number one, I'm not going to say anything during the deposition. I'm not going to make objections. I'm going to let you answer the questions because I don't believe in interrupting and, and, and having objections. Secondly, I'm going to tell them, listen very carefully to the question. And if you don't know the answer, say you don't know. If you don't remember, say you don't remember. And if you don't understand, say you don't understand. 
and then I will sometimes interject during a deposition if sometimes inadvertently a lawyer will ask a question that is, is not understandable or it's confusing or it may be two questions rolled up into one or as you said earlier I, right. I suspect that my witness is going to just start answering yes to everything I, I, then I interject I said that that question had two parts to it which would you like right. him to answer so again just be consistent all you're wanting to do is make sure your client your witness has a deposition transcript that's accurate and when you're taking the deposition you want the same thing you know there's a fellow in Philadelphia Joe uh, Foster who's uh, a very senior fellow now and a fellow of the college and Joe has a way of establishing a presence at the very beginning of the deposition when he is the defender which uh, annoys me because it's so effective um, but there's absolutely nothing wrong with it, and it's and it is effective. And just before the deposition is about to to, to start, Joe has a kind of a gravelly voice. Will say, <clears throat> "That's Mr. Supply. He's going to ask you some questions. Keep your voice up and tell the truth." And I always find myself thinking, uh, "There's something wrong with this." But I, how can I object to him telling his witness? to keep his voice up and tell the truth, but, but it, it is effective. Uh, people, uh, uh, inexperienced new lawyers who are watching this should understand uh, there is a qualitative difference between an objection, uh, however uh, querulous, and an instruction not to answer. And there are very limited circumstances where you can justify an instruction not to answer. It typically has to do with attorney-client privilege or some court imposed uh, limitation on discovery uh, or because you now intend to call the judge uh, but the general idea under the rules is you make your objection then the witness answers and if as you Jim say was, the, uh, a very bad question then they'll sort it out uh, uh, before trial um, uh, one other thing I'd, I'd mention, I, I haven't got it, gotten into a lot of motion practice on this, thank goodness, but, <clears throat> but when you read uh, the cases, you see that judges take a very quantitative approach to this kind of thing, and you'll see that uh, and you'll read an opinion that says something like, in the first 45 pages of the transcript, there were uh, 50 instructions uh, not to answer and a number of other comments and so forth. And meanwhile, uh, the in interrogator did nothing other than ask questions. And so the judge is not analyzing or whatever, and if you get that kind of a transcript, if you just take a highlighter and just highlight, uh, you're, you're going to have page after page of yellow, and it can be, uh, it can be a very effective advocate's piece. Um, yeah, I think so. One, one thing which we haven't touched upon that occurred during this vignette was uh, many times, maybe it's your witness, maybe it's the witness you're taking the deposition of, inadvertently doesn't answer, just shakes the head or says, uh-huh or uh-uh. And you always should speak up and make sure if it's your witness, say, would you please verbalize your verbalize. answer. <laughs> if it's the witness that you're taking the deposition and nobody, no one says anything, you know, feel free to always say, we need to have, the court reporter needs to have for the transcript a verbal answer. Um, yeah, and, and, and I, I think you, you need to be cognizant of the fact that you want the question and the answer to match so that they have, they convey the meaning of the witness. Um, so if you say to the witness, uh, uh, you did not attend that, you did not attend that meeting, uh, uh, is that isn't that so? And the witness says no. I mean, is he saying no? I didn't attend the meeting, or no, it isn't so. So you have to have that transcript running in your head or running in front of your eyes, and be alert enough to see uh, it's ambiguous. There's confusion here. Uh, need to clarify that. The double negative question. Yeah. And I always prepare my witnesses for that, and make sure that they clarify, and and or I would clarify it and try to make sure when you're taking a deposition don't ask a question that's a double negative because you don't know what the response means if they say yes you don't know what it means if they say no you don't know what it means 
Dennis, one, one comment I, I think might be good for the, the, the beginning lawyer is that tr try to work out your differences without a motion to compel or a motion for sanctions because judges do not like to referee discovery fights. One of my good friends who's one of the magistrates at home refers to him as sandbox fights. Yeah, I think that's I, I think that's right. And all of the threats that you hear uh, to call uh, judges during depositions, uh, I think they're just sort of the legal version of uh, I'm going to tell mom. <laughs> right. Right.